Let me give you a sense of where we're going to go this morning in this presentation. After a quick overview of the Desotel Faculty of Management and its position within McGill, I want to dive in directly and talk about the redesigned MBA that we have here. And in particular, what I want to focus on today is closer to the actual content of the MBA and focusing on how we're trying to integrate ideas and teaching about sustainability into the core of the MBA, which we think is quite different from what a number of other business schools are doing. Obviously, at the end, I'll discuss why we need your participation and your help in that, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So let's dive right in. So let me say a bit about McGill. Uh, I have to point out that McGill has a global reputation, but of course, I'm an American, and so I knew less about McGill growing up than probably many of you do. Uh, and that was to my real detriment. McGill is easily one of the leading universities in the world. We are creeping up on our 200th anniversary next year. And the university is also larger than you might expect. Across our 11 faculties, we have more than 40,000 students representing over 160 countries at this point. Uh, surely we have to be careful next year to make sure we get another 30 or so and then we can say every country in the world is present. Uh, McGill is also well known for its alumni. More than a quarter of a million of them could be found working all over the world. Uh, there's a couple of things for which this university holds a special place in my heart as an American. To me, one of the most famous graduates is actually Charles Drew who is one of the first African Americans to receive a medical degree, which he got from McGill because he couldn't do that in the United States at the time. Uh, you may know him as the man who invented blood transfusion and has saved literally millions of lives. And McGill gave him an opportunity that my own home country couldn't. And for that, this university has always held a special place in my heart. I think it's also worth pointing out that McGill sits in the heart of Montreal. And uh, if I can let those who are watching in on a small joke, I wanted to include a photo of Montreal in the winter, but we decided we didn't want to scare you because that's what people know. And instead, what I want to stress is how lovely a city Montreal is. Generally speaking, first, there are 4.2 million people in the metropolitan area of Montreal. This is also, over the last 10 years, developed into a major hub for artificial intelligence and machine learning research and startups who are trying to incorporate those concepts into their businesses. There are several other things that certainly anyone who's considering a degree in Montreal wants to keep in mind. For example, this has recently been rated the number six city in the world for students, both undergraduate and graduate, in terms of cost of living, opportunities for extracurricular activities, varieties of universities, and so on. Which basically means you don't want to become a landlord in Montreal, but you absolutely want to study here. I think it's also worth pointing out that in addition to the cost of living, this is a standout place in North America for things like its food and its music scene. I often tell people the best case I can make for moving to Montreal is that I relocated here two years ago from the Bay Area in California, and I haven't regretted it for a moment. Uh, it's, there are some real, not just hidden gems, but well-known ones here as well. The thing I would also stress is that this is a very young city and a very international city. 22, almost 23% of the population in Montreal is foreign born. And of course, roughly another 20% are the children of immigrants. And so whatever language you speak, you can find a community here in this particular city. Now, just a quick bit about the Desotel Faculty of Management as well, which we're here to talk about today. The Faculty of Management was founded just about 100 years ago, uh, initially with a bachelor's program, and we began offering MBAs several years later. In 2018, we were rated the number one MBA in Canada, uh, which is particularly impressive because we focus on a relatively small class size here at McGill. Our model has not been simply to uh, have turnover of large number of students, but instead we think it's very important to create a cohort of people who not only gain a specific set of skills, but also develop friendships, ties, and relations with one another and with the other students who have studied here. And we think that a small class size is one of the ways to achieve that. It's also a profoundly international student body in that 70% of the class comes from outside of North America, with the balance of that largely being Canadian students. We, like the rest of the university, have tended to place our faculty all over the world. Uh, the majority of our students tend to work in Canada, though, as you can certainly understand, given that more than 70% are from outside North America, that means a majority are actually changing countries at the end of their MBA and choosing to come to Canada to live and work but we've also placed alumni in more than 60 countries around the world. And of course, crucially, we have redesigned our MBA program last year. And that's what I wanna focus on 
today. So let me turn to that. I think the first thing to raise here is the context. Why did we decide to redesign our MBA program right now? And the first and simplest answer is we are following the market and we're following changes in business itself, which implies a lot of changes in business education. For example, we see increasing demand for many of the companies where our students are going to work for skills in artificial intelligence, financial technology, data analysis, design thinking, and other topics that are historically not covered in as much detail within business schools. Now, on the one hand, this is a challenge for any business school, but also for McGill and for Desotel, we recognize that there's a real opportunity here because McGill's placement here in Montreal in a global hub for artificial intelligence and analytics research means that this is an obvious opportunity for us to double down on many of these ideas in the teaching of our MBA. I think another reason it's important to consider a redesign is that the type of student who applies for a master's in business administration has changed over time. Increasingly, we find students who are not simply looking to leave where they work, get an MBA, and go back to where they were working at the same industry, usually in the same firm, uh, simply at a higher level in the hierarchy. I think a big change over the last 10 to 15 years is that increasing numbers of applicants are trying to use an MBA to change industries, to change jobs, often indeed to change countries. For those people, the ability to garner specific skills that they're going to use when they change jobs or industry is at least as important as the general managerial content of an MBA. And I think the third major reason I want to point out why we think it's important to redesign our MBA, and this is something that I've struggled with a lot in the 12 years since I started teaching in an MBA program, is an increasing number of the students that I meet who are applying for Masters in Business Administration are doing so because they want to have an impact in the world. And I want to underline that point because if you're younger, this may not be obvious, but this is historically quite new. The traditional idea with an MBA was that someone goes to work in a firm where they might spend a few decades of their lives. And then as they rise through the levels of management, at some point realize, I wasn't hired to run an organization. I was hired to do something. I was a great mechanical engineer. I was a good product manager. I was really good at marketing. But I wasn't necessarily trained in general skills for running an organization. The goal of an MBA, of course, is to give people those general skills and then bring them back in the organization, which is all well and good. And we want to make sure that MBA education doesn't abandon that core competency of general managerial expertise. At the same time, there has been a shift in recent decades where more and more people who are getting an MBA have the sense that this is a degree that gives them the tools that they need to generally have an influence inside organizations. And that means people aren't necessarily just thinking about rising and up the corporate ladder. They're paying attention to things like maybe I want to start my own company to have an impact. Maybe I want to enter an industry where I see really exciting things happening. Maybe I want to consider even nonprofit management or something else where I think that there is a social impact that this MBA is going to assist me with. As we have seen increasingly those changes in what students are looking for out of an MBA, we recognize that it makes sense to start redesigning the MBA to more closely match those student demands. And let me talk through some of the particulars of that. First, our MBA simply needed to be more flexible. This is part of the skeleton onto which we're going to attach the meat of the content of the program. And let me be clear why we did this. As you have changing demand from people who are interested in an MBA, those different demands imply different lengths of programs. Say for a moment that you are just looking for general managerial expertise and you want to return to the firm at which you previously worked. In that case, you want to be done with the MBA as quickly as possible. You might, for example, be interested in a fast 12-month program, and you don't have much of an interest, for example, in doing an internship because you're planning to go back to your original job. In North America, and to some extent in Western Europe, there has been an increasing demand for such programs, and we have an interest in meeting that demand. However, for someone who wants to change jobs or industries, 
it's at least as important that they can gain some specific skills and experience in that industry before they make the switch. For those people, an internship or other experiential opportunity is incredibly valuable. And so in those cases, we offer a 16-month option, which gives them the time to get those skills and experience in the places where they would like to work before completing the MBA. And finally, McGill has a history as part of Canada, which of course is a country of immigrants, of people who are at least as interested in coming to Canada to live and work as elsewhere. And for those people, a longer program is important, both to give them the skills and the experience working in this particular country, but also allowing them to be in a good position if they want to seek immigration or permanent residence after their MBA. For those people, spending 20 months in a program is incredibly valuable for allowing them to make that international transition. We have seen this diversification in our market over the last few years. And the challenge for us was how we could serve these people without necessarily sacrificing on program content. And so a major portion of our redesign has involved making sure that we have a flexible program length that still provides the same core content to all the students who take it. And so this I want to emphasize. Across those 12, 16, and 20 month options, we do not offer more or fewer courses. Students are getting the same general managerial education with specializations as they want them, regardless of the program length that they sign up for. Instead, what we vary are the experiential options. Things like the internship that I mentioned before that has variable use for different types of applicant. We've also introduced flexible specializations that help us to adapt our MBA offerings to changing student demands. Let me give you a sense of what that schedule looks like. The key point here, if you look at the diagram I have on screen, is that everyone starts at the same time, regardless of the program length that they have chosen. We think that this is incredibly important because at Desotel, we think we do not want to sacrifice that core managerial expertise that is the hallmark of a good master's of business administration. But also, and if I can speak for a moment as a professor of organizational behavior, I think it's very important that a class starts all at the same time because it's in starting together. It's in going through that core together that people develop the social relationships that are at least as valuable in a master's of business administration as the specific content that they learn in their classes. After people finish that fall core, then in the winter of their second term, they focus on taking electives, this is when our students go on their international study trip, which everyone in the class goes on. And we also have a live case that takes place during this time. Where the students start to diverge on the program length is during the summer. Students often go off and begin an internship or a practicum. A practicum is just where you do a deep dive study of a particular firm or industry under the supervision of a faculty member, as opposed to working in a firm during an internship. Students who don't, are not interested in that component can take electives during the summer and finish in 12 months. Otherwise, we are flexible on the length of that experiential component, which is what allows us to have students finish in 16 or 20 months without necessarily giving up on classes if they go for one of the shorter options. When I discuss an experiential component inside the MBA, let me just flesh that out a bit. First, there are some mandatory components that put students out in the world while they're working on their MBA. One of these is a live case. So in the winter term, we work with one company that has decided to partner with the Desotel Faculty of Management that year in a real business decision that they are making. And our students are broken up into teams. They investigate the industry and the firm's position within it and assemble presentations and recommendations. Partway through that class, we have a second meeting with the company, which we structure much like a due diligence call with investors. And based on that, students produce final presentations. Those presentations, the professor picks some of the best few. And at the end of the class, the company representatives return, hear those presentations, debrief with the students about what's going on. Shortly after the students finish that live case, it's time for them to leave to the international study trip. We spend 10 days in country somewhere, studying and comparing 
particular industries, particular firms, the local economy with Canada or indeed the students' home countries. This year we're going to Japan. That hopefully will change from year to year. The key point though is that we have the students together on that trip. So they are both in hearing about and learning about this foreign country, but also they have a chance to share ideas about what they've learned and apply it in that particular case. There are of course additional internships and practica that students can engage in. And like many schools, we do offer the possibility if one takes one of the longer programs to take an international exchange where the student would spend one of the terms at one of our partner institutions um, taking courses. The last thing we should talk about in terms of the structure of the redesign before getting into some of the specific content is that we have tried to personalize the content of the MBA to a greater extent. So historically, again, the MBA focuses on general managerial skills. And given the context in which the degree evolved, that makes a lot of sense. However, as I mentioned, many students are interested in changing industries, and that itself is a change from the past. For that, it becomes important for students to have specific skills that relate to those industries in addition to the general managerial skills that they'll learn as part of an MBA. We offer things like leadership skills, presentation of self, public speaking, networking, and so on, so that students can become the masters themselves of presenting themselves to the world, but also we want to make sure that they have the ability to customize their particular degrees in ways that make them attractive in the industries that they want to enter. And so this is why we have specializations. And the specialization itself is relatively straightforward. We let students take up to five classes around a common subject area and award that as a specialization. The other reason why we redesigned the MBA is these specializations are more flexible than how the MBA program was structured in the past, and that allows us to update the types of specializations that students can get relatively quickly, and thus we can change based on changing student demand. Now, the half dozen specializations that we're offering at the start of the term next year are shown here, global strategy and leadership, finance, marketing, business analytics, and investment management. We've also added a specialization in entrepreneurship uh, out of recognition that McGill already had quite a few classes related to the management of startups and entrepreneurial venturing. We just had no institutional support for it in the form of a specialization. That exists from this moment going forward. What I suspect many of you have already noticed though, based on the title of this presentation, is that there isn't a specialization for sustainability listed here. So let's turn to the question at hand. How do we make a redesigned MBA sustainable to the core? The decision not to offer a specialization in sustainability was one that I made and that I campaigned for quite hard as we redesigned our MBA. And I said that because I do not think that sustainability is a topic that should be present in a parallel track that a handful of the students choose to take as their specialization. I personally think that this is an important enough topic that all students should be thinking about it. And not just all students, frankly, all people in the world. If we're going to do that, then we don't want to have parallel classes on sustainability. We want to make sure that sustainability shows up in the core of that education. If in the future, sustainable management is a general skill that we want people to have, then it should be part of the general managerial education that we make sure to give students. And the thing I want to stress here is that this is far harder for business schools to implement than adding specific classes or hiring specific faculty to teach about sustainability. Now, many of you who are listening have a great deal of experience in interesting organizations. And you have probably seen the scenario that I'm about to describe, where an organization recognizes that there is an issue that they have to pay attention to more than they did in the past. This could be their environmental impact. It could be something like diversity in their hiring. Take your pick. In those cases, the first reflex that most organizations have is to create a parallel division for that issue. This is where someone says we have a new vice president who's going to cover this issue. We have a new task force 
focused on this issue. And what almost always happens to such organizations is that after two or three years, those people inside the firm who advocated for the change in the first place say, this is not enough. Our goal was not to create a parallel division that focused on this. Our goal was to change how we do business. Our goal was to integrate these issues into our day-to-day -day business practices. I say that this is the common thing that happens because I'm a professor of organizational behavior. I study this and I teach students about that happening. I argued that if we're redesigning an MBA, let's try to practice some of what we preach and let's try to be smarter in our design and skip a couple of years of that step by focusing on how we could bring this subject matter into the core itself. Now, what does that mean in concrete terms? It means that for every single one of the subjects that we teach in our core, we want to think seriously about how sustainability arises as an issue and can be addressed as an issue by that subject matter. And I want to emphasize as I say that, that we're trying to take a broad definition of sustainability. Indeed, as many advocates of sustainability have argued firms and businesses should do, rather than simply focusing just on the environment. And when I say that, I want to be clear, the environment is incredibly important. It is the foundation upon which these other issues arise. But there's a tendency for people to think about the environment as existing in conflict or in tension with existing business processes or with existing business functions. And I don't think that's the case. And so focusing on where sustainability comes up and tailoring that to different subjects is one of the ways that we can incorporate these ideas into our management core. Thus, for example, my colleagues in accounting focus on what is referred to as triple bottom line accounting, where they're taking into account both the financial, social, and environmental impact of particular decisions when doing cost projections. For my colleagues in operations, this is a fascinating time because the focus on zero waste production cycles and eliminating a lot of waste in production means that they have a new reason to focus on efficiency in a way that they haven't in the past. As a professor of organizational behavior, when you talk to me about sustainability, I like to talk about labor markets and how we hire people. For example, so many industries over the years have relied on the idea that they have an infinite line of people waiting outside the door to take entry-level jobs in that industry. A classic example is investment banking. After the financial crisis more than a decade ago, many investment banks realized that that line of potential employees had gotten a lot shorter and they couldn't keep burning through employees the way that they had. They had to redesign their own business processes to make sure that the people that they were hiring would stay around for the longer term because it was becoming harder to replace them. Now, it doesn't take a lot of creativity to notice that that is like saying we're no longer going to treat our personnel as an infinitely renewable resource. We have to focus on preserving it and making sure that our labor market is sustainable in the same way we might think about, for example, the environmental impact of our business. In other words, we're internalizing an externality. We're taking something that our current practices treat as unsustainable and making it something that will last. Even my colleagues in finance, who often joke that there's no connection between finance and sustainability, have seen over time an increasing number of students who are interested in impact investing, focusing on how they can use the tools of finance to change the incentives that other firms and industries face in order to be more sustainable in their own business practices. So in each of these ways, we want to focus on things that we think are going to lead students to notice that sustainability is not a subject that they have to learn in addition to everything else, but a way of thinking about those business processes today and how they can change those business processes in the future. And the part that excites me the most about that, because, well, for a couple of reasons, because I'm at the Desotel Faculty of Management, because I live in McGill, which is a hub for artificial intelligence and machine learning, and frankly, because I'm a gigantic nerd, is the way that we can pair sustainability with analytics. Because this is a point that I think people often miss. True sustainability means smarter management. It means, for example, we cannot content ourselves with one-size-fits-all approaches. 
It means we can't content ourselves with a short-term focus where we ignore the long-term because it's just too hard for us to think about. It means that we can't ignore the bigger picture for the same reason. We often have to customize the ways that we do business to take into account things that in the past we ignored. And almost by definition, those things that we ignored are what environmental economists refer to as externalities, right? It is in paying attention to those things that we produce more sustainable business practices. And in saying this, I want to recognize that all of this requires a massive data analytic capacity. And that is one of the things why I get excited as a professor at Des Hotel for this redesign of our MBA. Because in the more than a decade since I became an assistant professor, I have thought a lot about the future. I have wondered about how we were going to deal with these types of problems. And I've seen some of the connections between environmental and social sustainability and the future of business in terms of data and analytics. And so if I can, I just wanna paint a picture for a moment about industries where you might not necessarily think about why data and analytics are so important, but in fact, they drive the potential for sustainable practices in those industries. Now, I mentioned I'm American. In fact, I uh, grew up and went to high school in Texas. And so as a Texan, let me talk to you about cows. Cattle ranching might seem the opposite of a high-tech, future-driven industry. People who are in charge of ranching actually have to pay attention to a huge number of variables. Historically, where you move your cattle depends a lot on very specific conditions of those fields, the moisture content of the grass, how long it's been since that grass was fed upon by cattle, uh, the mineral quality of the soil, and the type of feed that those animals are getting by wandering around. The decision of how you move herds between different paddocks is actually quite complicated. Now, the solution we developed in the middle of the 20th century to solve this problem was to put animals in cages, feed them on artificial food, often heavily salted with antibiotics, and then hoping for the best. That's what I refer to as a one-size-fits-all solution. And it has had terrible side effects that many of us are familiar with. There are worries about contamination and antibiotic resistance that arise from the fact that we have overdrugged these particular animals and we keep them in unsanitary conditions. Furthermore, the actual land on which these animals live is no longer useful for growing grass. And there's an irony here because as any agricultural economist will tell you, if your goal is to max, minimize the cost per acre, uh, you should focus on growing things like grain. On the other hand, if you want to maximize the number of calories, human consumable calories you can get per acre, you should be producing something like grass-fed beef. But to do that, and to do that in a sustainable fashion, means you need to keep track of the conditions of that paddock as well as the conditions of your cattle, and recognize that you can have differing conditions across that herd and across your land. Many of the ranchers that I know in Texas increasingly talk about theirs as a computer-driven and a data-driven business. This is the kind of position where integrating analytic capacity is actually critical for them being able to quickly adapt their own practices to the demands of the environment in which they work. At the other end of the spectrum, but still, for example, staying in Texas, let's talk about wind. Wind power is one of the poster childs of sustainable business today and sustainability in general. However, if you have paid attention to the wind sector as well as the solar power sector, you may know that the fundamental challenge at this point facing power generation from renewable resources is not actually the generation of the power in and of itself. The cost per watt of producing via wind and solar power has been plummeting for years. Instead, it's a question of how we store the power that we have generated. Unlike current power systems, power generation from solar and wind sources is variable, and we need ways to store that power to match consumer demand. That, of course, means development of batteries and capacitors that can store the generated power, but it also means that electric power utilities have to be incredibly intelligent in how they think about using that power and storing it. This is why Google, for example, has been highly involved in many power generation projects in recent years because they're trying to develop machine learning techniques to more accurately forecast electrical demand. 
we need literally a smarter grid, which means smarter management. And let me tell you about one last example where I see a relationship, and that has to do with grocery stores and retail. Now, this is another place where the Desotel Faculty of Management have been heavily involved. This year, we've inaugurated a new Bensadoon School of Retail Management. Uh, but generally speaking, grocery stores are far more important to a sustainable food system than people often realize. For example, the open refrigerator or freezer cases from which you take food consume tremendous amounts of energy. Um, driving to and picking up your groceries takes up a huge amount of time and resources. Having items on shelves where consumers can pick them up requires a tremendous amount of individual packaging, which itself produces a gigantic amount of non-recyclable waste. It would be far more efficient for a grocery store to just prepare people's orders and deliver them to their houses. Now, you might say, well, then we have all these delivery trucks driving around, but keep in mind, people are already driving their own vehicles to go to the grocery store. And if you can route those delivery vehicles efficiently, you take fewer trips overall. In the future, I suspect very few of us will be going to a grocery store. In a more sustainable future, we will all do our shopping online and have things delivered to our houses. But to make that work, grocery stores have to be incredibly smart when it comes to logistics, expediting, and delivery. So notice what I'm talking about here in each of these cases are industries that are far from tech as it's often considered. And yet they have a reliance on high technology, on analytics, on machine learning, and other new ideas that I think are incredibly important if these industries are going to be more sustainable in the future. We mustn't think about sustainability as simply not doing business. We have to think about it as doing business better and more efficiently. And again, that means we change our business processes. That means we change how we do management. That's why we're redesigning our MBA. So where do people like you come into this? I said that true sustainability needs smarter management. I also wanna stress that it needs smarter managers. Over and over, as we have redesigned this MBA, it is as much from the expressed demands wishes and ideas of our students as it is, for example, from our faculty or from our alumni. Students have been crucial in every stage of this process, both in advocating for change and suggesting directions we might move. And that to me is rather exciting because rather than teaching as I would in an old MBA, topics that people don't necessarily think are as relevant to their lives as they once might have been, we can focus on coming up with solutions to ideas that everyone agrees are relevant for all of our lives. We're in a position where we can change MBA education together. And it wouldn't be a presentation of an MBA without a pitch for recruiting. If any of this seems interesting to you, and I certainly hope it does, I'd encourage you to apply. The final deadline for applications for students coming from outside Canada is the 15th of March. I've included the costs here. I want to stress that we are competitive, and you should look at the exchange rate for the Canadian dollar as you look at those numbers, and also that we are quite generous with our scholarships, particularly toward international students. So with that, I will pause. I hope you have found this enlightening as a sense of what this MBA looks like, and I'll be happy to take any of your questions. All right, thank you, John Paul, for your presentation, and we have a lot of questions from our audience. So. The first is, Gabriela is asking, is there any possibility for an agreement for a double degree with Latin American universities? Thank you for the question, Gabriela. Currently, the way we do exchanges, and we have that set up as our uh, system by which we tend to have people move back and forth. For example, we've placed several students in Mexico over the last couple of years. Uh, we also have an agreement with the University of Pacific, I believe, in Peru. We don't necessarily do joint degrees, in these particular cases. Um, however, I think the exchange is often the position through which someone can say that I got my degree at McGill, for example, while spending time and studying with faculty or students at another university. Perfect. Uh, Nandini asks, is there a specific and viable career track related to sustainability? What are the existing and identified career opportunities and companies offering roles related to sustainability in the Canadian Western job market? Thank you, Nandini. It's a good question. I think that I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a professor of organizational behavior. And that's a field that's taught in every business school 
and your typical MBA student doesn't really know what that word means, organizational behavior. I swear this is an answer to this question. Organizational behavior is the how of management. We focus on how you motivate people, how you build organizations to carry out plans. And I often point out to people that almost no one gets a degree with a specialization in organizational behavior at a business school. Instead, people get a concentration in another field, but the ones who pay attention in an organizational behavior class and who think about those ideas seriously often do better in their field because they can both focus on the thing that they were hired to do and understand things like recruiting, motivation, retention, and so on. This is the pitch I would make for sustainability. I do not think our job should be simply to place people in occupations that are currently thought of as sustainability occupations. Those do exist. But for the most part, I think it is more important that we place people in all sorts of jobs where they pay attention to how the impact of what they do is or is not sustainable. And so even as organizations increasingly are hiring people to help them think about how they can become more sustainable in their practices, I think a good way to think about a, a degree with a focus on sustainability is that it should come through every class that you're taking so that you can use this in your own day-to-day -day operations inside the organization. I think, for example, someone who works in finance, who can also explain the sustainability or lack thereof of current business practices and how to change them, will do better in finance than someone who doesn't have that same training. All right. So super neat. And Joe asks if you can elaborate, elaborate more about the investment management special, specialty. So the investment management specialization particularly focuses on um, real world experience managing investments while you're getting your MBA. Now I included an asterisk on that slide just to point out there are an additional set of courses that students take that are related to that particular specialization, partly in cooperation with the McGill Investment Management Institute um, because that one in particular, the additional course requirements and the like, uh, give them a larger experiential component in the direct practice of investment management while they are here. Um, that said, for example, if a student was interested in working in Canada after the degree but they are not themselves Canadian, they would have to take the 20 month option in any case if they wanted to have been in school long enough to qualify for things like permanent residence in Canada after their schooling. And so I think the key point is the investment management program, you take that through the longer program track, you're provided with more experiential real world experience during the MBA, and then the idea is that that one we're almost always assuming that that student is going to work in an investment management firm of some kind. Perfect. So Andrea is asking if the 20 month program also gives a two year work permit. <laughs> you notice in my the answer to my last question partly holds the answer to this question. So Andrea, it's a very fair point. The setup for that, the reason we have made sure that even as we focus on the uh, students who are interested in a shorter length program is that we know that many students historically have come to McGill because they want to live and work in Canada. For those students, it's very important that we have a program length that is compatible with securing a work permit afterward. That is why the 20-month program exists in that current form, why we keep it and continue to support it. Yes, that leads to being able to get a work permit. Perfect. Uh, Sam is asking here three questions that are all related, and he asks, uh, are there specific industries or employers McGill has partnered with to help students find employment in sustainability-related fields after the MBA? Are there any student ambassadors working in sustainability-related fields post-MBA that applicants may contact? And have any former MBA students completed internships related to environmental, social, and governance and analysis? I'm tempted to say yes, 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 and move on, but I suspect that Sam would like some more details. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to firms, uh, often where we have had firms that are interested in doing impact investing has been one of the spots where we have partnered with people. Um, several of our firms that focus on primary goods coming in the Canadian market, so things like paper and forestry products, uh, there has been an interest in working with McGill students. 
And actually, and this again is where I want to point out the synergy between sustainability and analytics, it has often been firms that are interested in hiring our students to use their analytic capacity to help them with things like supply chain optimization or other environmental or social impacts of their business processes where we have seen those partnerships bear the most fruit. In terms of student ambassadors, um, both at the MBA level and also at the undergraduate level throughout McGill, we have students who have been highly interested in how we can bring sustainability more into our teaching. And so we professors have worked with students and recent alumni, for example, to write new case studies that we can bring into the classroom of companies that have made such attempts. Um, I have a case, for example, I wrote a couple of years ago about a pineapple company in Ghana that specifically focuses on doing the processing of the fruit locally and then airlifting that material to markets in Europe. Now, at first, when we talk about airlifting fruit, that might sound as though that's highly unsustainable, but 70% of the weight of a pineapple is removed during processing, and many of those planes were returning empty to European markets. And so it's not adding any net carbon emissions to the existing economy, right? And they produce it much more cheaply. So I and a network of students and a network of professors here have focused on specific cases and are delighted to talk to incoming students about opportunities for these kinds of jobs. The final point in terms of alumni is one where I'd be happy to follow up on email on that particular question. Uh, I've been at McGill for the last two years, and so I don't know a lot of the alumni personally as well, but we have many people here who do, and we're happy to follow up with that kind of information. Perfect. Um, Amanda is asking, um, can you define sustainability? You mentioned diversity, environmental impact. Is that all it means? No. It's not all it means. It's a very good question because people often say, are you just focusing on protecting the environment when you discuss sustainability? I take a broader definition, as I think many of us at McGill and at Desotel do. Sustainability refers to, I think I'm gonna use the French term for a moment, which is development durable, durable development. And I think that is a point that we want to keep in mind when we talk about sustainability, right? There's a sense that we have a practice that we can continue indefinitely, which means we don't require inputs from a finite resource, for example. Originally, the idea of sustainability developed when people were talking about fossil fuels, out of a recognition that many of those fuel sources were finite and would run out if we can, fairly quickly if we continue to use them at the rates we were using. They were, almost by definition, unsustainable. And that's a good analogy to have in your mind as we talk about sustainability more generally. Are there issues, for example, in a labor market where we think that the way that we hire workers is unsustainable because we will run out of that type of worker? The example I gave earlier about investment banking and their decision that they had to change their processes in order to use more of the employees that they were hiring because they were seeing smaller numbers of prospective employees at the door is a good example of that. Um, I think, and again, when we think about how we keep track of the finance and accounting of different lines of business, uh, if we're ignoring things that are ultimately going to affect the health of the business, then potentially our practices are unsustainable. And so it's not as much that accounting itself would collapse, but accounting is the thing that we have to use in order to make sure that these resources that we think are important are not being used at an unsustainable rate. All right. Nandini is asking, does McGill plan to work with companies and industry leaders in the consulting energy and other fields to make sustainability an integral part of their work processes? We do and we plan to continue. Um, the live case that I mentioned is one of the things that all MBAs take part in while they're getting their degree at Desotel. We, as I mentioned, we recruit one company per year that we work with on a real-time decision. For us, that serves two purposes. For the students, it's obviously a formative experience where they can apply the knowledge that they have learned in the core of the MBA program. But also for those companies, this is a chance to get to know McGill and get to know the interests that we have in promoting sustainability and business practices. And so this is one of the several ways that we try to encourage those particular connections with business partners such that we can continue working on these issues in the time ahead. Perfect. 
so we are going to move on to a more specific question. So um, Nandini asks if one as a student can change the length of their MBA after having initiated the program, let's say six months into the program. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, this is a fairly, we, we keep this in mind because it wouldn't count as a flexible MBA if you were locked in from day one. The, I mentioned 12 month, 16 and 20 month options. You'll notice that the 16 and 20 month options in particular, the length of the internship is what varies. If a student prefers to graduate in say 16, having planned to come out in 20, as long as the work is done, there's no official paperwork that they have to file. It's the same degree. There is a nominal difference between the 12 month option and the others in that the 12 month degree does not include the internship. But notice that the admissions criteria are the same for the two degrees. So if a student wishes to transfer between those two, they don't have to reapply or do anything else. They simply have to file some paperwork with our student affairs office so that we know which of those programs they're in. Um, the main re now, a student may decide for other reasons, if they, for example, came in on the 20 month program, because I know, I believe it was Andre who had a question about whether it comes with a, uh, it brings with it the two year work permit. If you come in on the 20 month program and then switch to one of the shorter ones, you wouldn't qualify for that work permit. They still care about the time spent in the program. But absent those kind of external considerations, there is all but complete flexibility in changing between those program lengths once a student has begun the program. About the 16-month program, Dina has, is asking that uh, she, she'd like to understand how working a 16 months allows someone to change industries. How are they equipped to be able to market themselves as problem solvers for other industries that they have not worked in before? This is why over time we have focused on two parts of the MBA. The first is that we want to change some of the classes to be less theory and more practical based. That means that students can focus on gaining specific concrete skills that people are looking for in a particular industry. At the same time, the advantage of an MBA as opposed to a more specialized master's degree in terms of the tools that it gives a student is they have that training as well as general managerial expertise. And so often when someone is looking to enter a new industry, uh, rather than entering completely at the ground floor with an MBA, you have someone who is in a position both familiarity with the concrete work that is done by people in that industry as well as a more general skill and ability to manage people who work in that particular industry. And as I mentioned, for a lot of firms, you have, there's a shortage of smart middle managers. You can often find people in your industry who are being turned out at the university level who have some of the specific tools that they look for in the trade. What they lack is necessarily someone who has enough familiarity with those tools and enough familiarity with general management that they can help them scale their organizations. And in those cases, someone who has an MBA plus familiarity with their industry, which they've gained through a combination of those specific courses and the internships and other things that they do while they're getting their MBA, that makes for a very attractive package. All right, Utsap is asking, which countries have students visited for study trips and which companies did their visit while in that country? And what is the average G, uh, GRE score of the class? The average, so we do not use the GRE. Um, we tend to use the GMAT for most of our students. Obviously, if you take in the GRE, um, we use uh, their own translation in terms of score compatibility. The average GMAT score is 670 of the entering class. As far as the international study trips, uh, quite a few have been to the Pacific Rim in recent years. Uh, with Japan, China, and the Philippines being among those. Uh, Brazil is another. And like I said, I'm biased. I would love to go back to Brazil. Um, but um, I think in the future, I also want to make sure that we spend some more time, for example, in Eastern Europe as a possibility, as well as perhaps a trip to India at some point. As far as the specific companies, I'm going to admit ignorance, and I'd happily get back to someone with more of the details. Um, I'm new in my position as the MBA director since the last student trip, so I don't remember the list of companies off the top of my head. Last year's was in Japan, and I'd ha be happy to follow up with that if someone wants to know which companies were visited. All right. Uh, 
And Amanda is asking how many students tend to get scholarships and if is there help for international students who, who need financing. And what is the cost of living in Montreal compared to other large city, cities in Canada, US, and Europe? It's an excellent question. First, regarding scholarships, uh, the overwhelming majority of our students receive at least some financial aid uh, through the program. Um, the purport, as a proportion of the cost, um, what international students receive is substantial. There's absolutely support that way. Um, we have more than $2 million in scholarship funding that we give out every year. Um, we also recently received a very large gift from a generous alumni donor, uh, specifically to provide scholarships for helping with master's education. Um, we recognize that any MBA is a substantial financial commitment by the student who's taking it, and our goal is to make sure that we're admitting people based on their potential, not simply on their ability to pay, and then making sure that we can make them whole and they can get through the program. In terms of the, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of the question? Um, if, uh, what is the cost of living in Montreal compared to other large cities in Canada, US, and Europe? Thank you very much. The cost of living is one of the most appealing things about Montreal, frankly. Uh, I moved to Montreal from San Francisco. Um, and so, as far as I'm concerned, everything in Montreal is free uh, because San Francisco is so very expensive. Um, I often point out to people that my apartment is one third larger and costs half as much. Um, Montreal of the major cities in Canada has the lowest cost of living, um, certainly compared to Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and we are also slightly lower, for example, than uh, Chicago and Houston in the United States. We're definitely cheaper uh, than places like New York and San Francisco. Uh, in terms of Europe, you will find that Montreal is cheaper than London and Paris, um, though that isn't saying much given the cost of those cities. Um, I have heard students say comparable, for example, to the cost in Madrid or Barcelona in terms of living for a student. All right. Um, Rani asked uh, that you mentioned personalization for personalization of sorry you mentioned no personalization of specialization. So does it mean we can pick specific subjects from different specializations? Our goal has been um, I'm going to give slightly more background information uh, than Rodney probably wants in what I mean by that. The short answer is. We, our goal in creating the specializations was that a student should be able to come to us in student affairs and say, I want to be able to go out on the job market and say that I have a specialization in the following subject. And I think that if I take these five classes, which you offer, that it's reasonable to call that a specialization in this subject. And that we working with the student should be able to say, yes, we agree. We'll grant that those five subjects work in that way. Um, that means, for example, that someone may focus specifically on, like right now we don't have a specialization in impact investing. We have a specialization in finance and we have a specialization in investment management, but we haven't thought in that direction. In the coming years, as we add classes on impact investing or other sustainable elements of finance, I can easily imagine a student saying, I have taken these classes, I would like to be able to market myself to the world as having focused on impact investing. And we, through student affairs, could issue that student sort of the letter if they need to back it up uh, to an employer saying the student has specialized in the following thing. Um, again, that's the structure of our specializations that we want to make sure that we can alter them based on student demand. Because the alternative, and this is why I say I would go into more detail, the alternative is that we try to forecast for the next five to 15 years, what the major specializations are that students would want, put those on the books, and then don't really change them. This is how business schools tend to do it. We're trying to avoid that because we recognize that we are not the experts in forecasting market demand over the next decade. We're good at it, but we also want the feedback from our students. All right, our last question is from Joyce, and uh, is about organization behavior. And you mentioned that analysis. Does it make any difference to have a police foundation college program for a continual proceeding to MBA in this hotel? Um, is this better than having a theoretical GMAT examination score? 
Uh, I love that the last question is on organizational behavior. You've given me a small gift. I do not think that a specific undergraduate degree is necessary for proceeding to an MBA. Um, and frankly, some degrees help, but it depends on what you want to do. This is where I want to come back to talking about the flexibility and personalization of the MBA. If there were one type of degree that was useful over all others, that would suggest that the MBA is not that flexible or personalizable. The reason why a good MBA program, such as that at Des Hotel, focuses on a core that all students take together is our recognition that a lot of the things that are really important for a manager to understand haven't been taught at the undergraduate level, which frankly, frankly makes sense because for a lot of undergraduates, they don't have the real world experience they would need for those lessons to sink in. And so we think it's more important that some of that is taught together when a cohort enters a program than it is in advance. Obviously, if you have an undergraduate degree in one of the subjects that's taught at an MBA program, I think it may ease some of the transition to higher education, and it may simplify some of those specific courses, but it's not a magic bullet and it's not a requirement. Perfect. Thank you, um, John Paul, for answering all the questions. And we had this really interesting talk. And we are going to end today's webinar by America Economia and McGill University, the Hotel Management Faculty. So thank you so much, John Paul, for your time. And of course, thank you for our audience for participating and for your attention. And we will meet next time in a new webinar by America Economia. Good afternoon. My pleasure. Take care.